Parnell, and I am the Executive Director for ASU's Career and Professional Development Services. Uh, we have a phenomenal panel uh, group here today to talk about some of the innovations and disruption that's happening at ASU. But before I introduce our panelists, I do want to share a little bit of context um, for our panel today. So in about the last decade or so, career services in particular has undergone some pretty steep disruption around the ROI of a college education and the challenge to that. And the old model of career centers being a physical place where a student has to go across campus to walk through the doors and actually come in to receive services and support, typically from a master level professional in a one-on-one -on -one advising session for one hour, that model is long gone. And now career centers are really starting to integrate across the fabric of the entire university system and really integrating into the ecosystem to foster those career readiness skill sets. We call it more of a presence than a place. And so our partners today, uh, respected colleagues and friends, are here to showcase some of those innovations around career readiness, corporate engagement, academic partnerships, and entrepreneurship that's taking place at ASU. They are cutting edge leaders, transforming corporate engagement efforts, disrupting traditional curriculum design and teaching, and equalizing the trajectory of non-traditional groups of college students into the workplace. So please help me in welcoming Paul Lepore, Nicole Taylor, and Grace O'Sullivan to our panel today. So Nicole, I'm gonna go ahead and have you kick us off and set the stage for us in describing today's college student at a large public research one university and what is afforded to students in terms of their support and meeting their needs and if you could also speak a little bit to the fact that what does industry need to know about this next generation of new college graduate coming into the workforce. Great, thank you. Um, so let me give you just a little bit about who I am today and who I'll be in a boat. I'm, I'm off at ASU right now. I'm the Dean of Students for the university. So on the ground, we have about 73 to 75,000 students. Um, and so that's quite a bit of um, young people, majority of whom are traditional college age students, but we have a large uh, veterans population um, and adults returning back to college or going to college for the first time, but a vast majority are young people. And because I'm Dean of Students, I get to see just how great their decision making <laughs> is not <laughs> on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, it's um, what I'm about to tell you is, is now the norm, but it, our institutions don't seem to um, really integrate this information. So in 1980, 81% of the undergraduate population was white. 81. In 2014, 55% was white. We don't have the latest numbers because uh, that, those numbers came out in 2016 out of the Department of Education. And at ASU, 50% of our first time students, so 50% mm -hmm. of our freshman class right now are not white. That's just the given. And so as we think about who we're educating, um, if we just stop, started at that alone, um, it changes the game. And then when you look at who's teaching these students and who's administering our colleges and who's managing our colleges, the, that demographic hasn't shifted as dramatically as the student population. So we have a lot to learn both from the students we see and from what's happening in our um, society. Uh, and a very telling statistic is when you look at venture capital and the investments in startups, there's $58 billion that have been invested in startups over the last year. 1% went to minority business enterprises. Well, I just laid out who the mm -hmm. undergraduate population is. They're far more than 1% of the population, right, um, uh, that it, that's in school. So the perspectives that they bring and the life experiences they bring are very different, but our institutions are still structured in a way that cater to the student population in the 1980s, of which I was one, right? So a lot of the same structures are in place. Before ASU, I was at Stanford, so I'm not just talking about what, it was, what it's like in a public institution, I'm also talking about a private institution. We happen to be in a very innovative institution where we buck the trend 
more so than others, and that's great, but even then, mm -hmm. we run it, we sometimes get in our own way as, as we try to do our innovations. Um, the other, the other what we have come to embrace, those of us who are on the student service, student facing, student support side, is who they are. This is the helicopter parented generation. That's not going away. I have more parents that reach out to me as dean of students than I have students. Yeah. That's just the given. <laughs> Okay, nine months ago, it was annoying. Now, it's the given. So our whole mode of how we do our business has had to shift, knowing that we actually do have to deal with the parents or family members as well as the student, and what does that really mean? It's not going away, because my son is a senior in high school. I tried to do better, but <laughs> I'm as guilty as, as the parents of my college students. The other piece is, um, and no surprise, coping skills, you know, so we talk about soft skills mm -hmm. that, as, as students head into the marketplace. Coping skills is not among them because we have conditioned them this way. Everybody got the soccer trophy, everybody got the ribbon in swimming, everybody won, everybody won. Well, we know everybody doesn't win in life, right? But we, this is our fault. We have conditioned this generation, next generation of students, current generation and next generation that way. Um, and what this results in is the transition from High, you know, secondary to post-secondary life, that high school to, to college transition is dramatic anyway. It is hyper dramatic for our current college uh, student. We have seen a 92% increase in our counseling appointments over the five, from five years ago. And that's 52% increase in unique students visiting our counseling center. So, um, and the students today who maybe when I was in school, weren't able to make it even through high school and into college now can because they have wonderful psychopharmaceuticals which have helped them deal with ADHD or men actual uh, mental illness or disease or stress or depression. So they're making it through to colleges in ways that they didn't before. And again, our institutions aren't necessarily built for who they show up as. We've done a tremendous job, I'm proud to say, of our colleagues at ASU in terms of really adapting to the, this, this demand in terms of how we help our current student populations just deal with life and stress and anxiety. This is not an ASU issue, this is a college issue, this is a higher education issue. Those of you who work in a higher ed know exactly what I'm talking about. Then you add things like DACA, right? And regardless of as an adult in the United States where you may think about that, we have college students who see a, a, a peer as a peer, regardless of their immigration status. So it just complicates even how they're experiencing school and how they're experiencing this thing called higher education. Um, so all of this is what is in the mix when we talk about how are we, how are we preparing this generation of students for the world of work? How are we preparing their, their actual hard skills, technical skills? How are we preparing their soft skills, which are not just social and emotional, but also the coping? And knowing that, you know, it, and one of the things I, I do get many students, and I'm sure you do in career services, where they're like, I just don't know what I'm gonna do with my life. I'm like, um, your generation are gonna have like five career lives, mm -hmm. right? So let's not stress about that because we know that that's just an added layer of stress. Let's talk about your next thing and the kind of skills that will help you no matter what you choose to do or what you do after your first step out of school. So we ha we've taken an approach at ASU that it, all of this preparation doesn't just happen in career services. It happens in counseling services. It happens in the Dean of Students office. It happens in the colleges and their student service support models. It happens on anyone who is student facing where we take the, the um, responsibility across the university and don't just send the students to that one office because they know how to deal with this. We really try to do what's done in corporate community is um, cross-train, right? We try to make sure that, that folks, if you see something, you say something, you support the student as they're presenting in front of you. We don't mean to become a psychiatrist. We don't want that. We don't mean to become a social worker. But you can talk to the student and help them really think through things in ways that um, you didn't really need to do a generation ago, or even five, forget a generation, five years ago, four years ago. So that is the snap, I just wanted to lay that out as the context, a lot of you may know that, but as adults sometimes we forget that this is who we're dealing with, 
and some of you are parents to college students, so you know exactly mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and some of you are grandparents to college students, and yes, the, that means your kids' kids are, are, are the ones I'm talking about. So um, that, that's the snapshot mm -hmm. and the landscape that we deal with um, as, we, as we try to really um, help develop these young, these young minds and these, these young folks. And um, one of the things we try to do for companies and for people who are trying to recruit our students is to have them understand who these workers are. And that this really should be a partnership. Like we can't expect to prepare them on our own for the world of work and the world of work we know can't do it on their own either. So um, we like to take the knowledge that we have because we've had them for a few years and figure out how best to prepare them um, for, for the companies and for the, uh, the kind of work that you need. One of, the, one of the things that I did at my former institution is work with some of the Silicon Valley companies and the hiring managers in the different departments. Mm -hmm. Um, because if the, the, the heads of the HR folks might have gotten it, but the students actually go into these individual units and these individual departments in an organiz or individual organization in a company, and those hiring managers within those units and within those departments, actually we wanted to make sure that they understood mm -hmm. who these new employees were and what they're bringing with them mm -hmm. and what they're not, and how can we, we you know, make sure that there's a two-way communication and that some of the things mm -hmm. that we're to do. Yeah, and so partnership is definitely, I think, a theme of the conversation. Right. So um, thank you, Nicole. I'm going to sure. move to Grace because now we're talking about employers, we're talking about corporations, um, and how we engage with corporations. So Grace, can you share with us the trending landscape of corporate engagement with universities, that partnership, and can you share how you are leading innovative engagement with various industries across ASU? Yes, absolutely. Thanks for the question. Thanks, everybody. Um, the way I'm looking at this and how we do things at ASU is we're really taking a look at the entire ecosystem. So our industry partners aren't just passive recipients at the very end of the pipeline just catching talent. We really invite them to come along with us for the entire journey. So um, if you think about when companies come to the market, they say, what does your talent look like? Mm -hmm. So that's why we have such a close relationship with the Career Services Office. But we're engaged with them all along the way from site selection to talent, to upskilling their current workforce, to investing in research and philanthropy. So we really try to paint this whole picture so they're not just left at the end saying, okay, well, no, that's not good enough. So we, we really invite them along and say, engage with our students early. What do you need? What do you see that's missing from our curriculum? Come join our dean's councils. Help us shape our curriculum. Uh, help us teach a class. Become an adjunct faculty member. So don't just sit there and complain and saying like, oh, you don't have the skills. Help us build the skills because we need you to help keep us relevant. And that's been a really great model and a very successful for lots of partners. Great, thank you, Grace. Um, I know you've been engaging quite a bit with mm -hmm. employers mm -hmm. as the new Future Center is coming to fruition. What thoughts might you have around the corporate engagement space and connecting with universities, Paul? Well, thanks, Cindy. So Cindy made reference to what we're creating in my college. My college is the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. We have about 23,000 students and about 90 different majors as undergrads. 18,000, give or take, are our undergraduate population. The others are graduate students, and uh, it's probably not a shock if I were to tell you that the question I get from a lot of parents is, you know, what am I, what's my son or daughter going to do with this degree? And there's a lot of things that they do with this degree. If you've gone to a lot of the other panels here, the, the data are pretty clear. Arts and Sciences students are quite successful, though I don't think we do either a good job of either convincing them of that, helping them to share what that, those success uh, points are, or yeah, working with the companies and, and the uh, the businesses to, to actually recognize those students. I, I, you know, you ask the general question, how many of the business leaders here are engineers? And no hands go up. If you're a history major, or I'm a sociologist, or an English major, or a biology major, actually you get far more hands rising in the room. So here's my challenge. Um, one, we need to, to think about career readiness as not this evil um, uh, intrusion into the arts and sciences space. I do think that in many ways our faculty say, well, that's beneath me, shouldn't do that. And I think that's changing. 
we need to have career readiness be a part of the undergraduate experience, um, as, as my colleagues have been reflecting on from the beginning. Uh, that's including with students looking to explore the 90 majors in our college or the th more than 300 that the university offers to be able to look at what the possibilities are. But we also need to curate the experience on the employer side. And so if on one hand I'm looking to put career readiness into the freshman year and develop one credit classes so students can think about all the things that they need to do outside of being good students in the class, but all those um, value added uh, points, internships, uh, job shadowing, study abroad opportunities, um, just imagining what the possibilities are. Uh, the companies need this curation as well. Um, there are some wonderful companies, there, many of them are at this conference, that have very elaborate HR plans to onboard their new employees. And when they think about internships, it's not just a um, uh, come on in, sign up for this, and, and photocopy for us over the summertime. In many cases, it's giving them rotations across a whole range of different parts of the company to be able to have mentors, to be able to have authentic uh, experiences. There are a lot of companies that haven't a clue of how to do it. They either they don't have the personnel and they don't have the expertise. And so one of the things, and this is a partnership uh, that we're doing with Cindy's office, as soon as we said, so we're moving, we're creating a future center. It's because our college actually is inheriting the old law school at ASU, because uh, the law school moved downtown. And the president, Michael Crow, some of you might have heard him yesterday, asked the deans, do you have any good ideas with us? So we had a lot of good ideas for students. He said, okay, go for it. And as part of reimagining student services, if you want to hear about that, I can talk about it. We decided to create a career center, but I didn't want to call it a career center because it would look like what business and engineering have, and that's not what arts and sciences students need. It's a future center. Many of our students go to graduate school, they go to professional training. And for this to work, it's not just the education of the, the undergraduate side. We need to work really carefully with the company so they feel that the partnership is two-sided. And so if you think about this as a space, think of maybe as in, from my administrator's hat, I have students, I have families, I have faculty, I have alums, and I have corporate and business leaders in the community. And this is a place at which all of them have a role. All of them can come together to help, help train students in lots of different career paths in businesses and nonprofits and government, all these other things. And so for some of the companies, it could just be giving us content. Help us in our ASU 101 to talk about what career readiness means in the healthcare industry. A lot of our students go into that. Some are going in as doctors, some are going in as administrators, some are going in um, as translators, working along with uh, families in the valley to be able to make sure they get the most out of the healthcare industry. And that could be just providing an ear and to be able to listen to what's missing and putting that into places we already have. It could be actually helping us create specific classes. What does a pre-law track look like? What does a pre-entrepreneurial track? What does just career 101 look like for sophomores early in their experiences? And they can help us do that. I think as you get more, uh, the partnerships became, become more real and more authentic, then you can work with companies to create either what we call problems of practice. Here's something that my industry, the insurance industry, is working with right now. Can you get a team of students to work on it? Maybe I'll come in as a guest lecturer if I'm the insurance uh, company down the street, like State Farm or wherever else is in the valley, and work with you collaboratively. The other could be what I would call a project of practice, something that's more elaborate. Quite common in places like MBA programs where a company says, here's something I want you to work on for six months. I might even help pay for the MBAs working on it. And we could do that at the undergraduate level. Maybe they'll co-teach, as, as Grace said, tie it together. And then we had the traditional internships where if we can help curate the experience, to be able to say it has to be something more than photocopying or sitting behind a desk answering phones, but to really work with them, then you start seeing what I think the, the, the goal would be is an extended relationship between companies and the places where we want to place students and our students. Because it's 30 billion a year, I guess I was looking at that as in preparation for this, of the swirl of losing the millennial generation because it's not a good fit, because we haven't worked really hard at it, I haven't prepared them well enough as an administrator and as a dean. Um, that's, a, that's real money, and if we can actually help them to actually create the space and the place and the pathway, that experience over two, three, four years is something when then they bring the person on for the job, they know exactly what they have, and the student knows exactly what they have. And if they move between those different opportunities, as many of my students do, great, awesome. My job is to actually help them and not make that as part of a failure experience, but as part of what it means to be an undergraduate in arts and sciences. 
And so, Paul, you're speaking to some of the most transformative solutions are when we involve both employers mm -hmm. and educators to drive curriculum and career readiness design. Um, Grace, I'm going to go back to you because this is a large part of, of what you do in taking in um, companies and organizations, assessing their needs, and then thinking big, thinking yeah. very, very big and strategically about how to integrate them into the fabric of our ASU experience. So can you speak to a little bit about the work with industry partners, um, maybe that you want to highlight, that are really engaged at all levels of the university and what that looks like for the student experience as well? Yeah, absolutely. So this model that we're launching at ASU is called the Practice Labs. So think of this as problem-based learning where you're in an environment where you can actually test the skills. So we have a, one of our great, wonderful partners, Starbucks. They have a technology center practice lab that's co-located with us at ASU. And they've hired full-time employees to be embedded with us on campus, hiring our okay. interns. And really for them, the internship is the new interview. So our students are going through this experiential learning opportunity on campus with us so they don't have to go to a summer internship away. This is just part of their daily life, part of their learning. They get to work on real business problems mm -hmm. and find solutions. So what they couldn't figure out back at HQ, they give to our students and they get rapid <laughs> rapid designs and new, new ways of thinking and their staff are learning too from us. Um, so that I think is a real, the, the, tr the trend um, and what we also hear, to go back to your first question um, on the landscape, is that when we ask companies, you know, what kind of students are you looking for, undergraduate or graduate, they say, we don't care. Whoever can do Who the work, the yeah. Right. So um, that's, that's really interesting shift there. So we have engagements where students are co-located with companies, and then when they graduate, they get hired into the company right away. So um, that also helps them um, get to know uh, the company issues and then we build that trust in saying, okay, you produce really great students, right. now let us get to know your faculty, how can we sponsor some research? Right. Um, so with Starbucks, we also have the College Achievement Plan. Mm -hmm. So that's where, the, that's where the relationship started where Starbucks partners can, um, uh, you know, at no cost right. to the partner, uh, receive a degree from ASU online. And it started there as a tuition benefit, and then it just blossomed from what, what else can we do together? So that's been a great partnership. I have a question for Paul. Can I jump in? Yes, <laughs> please do, Paul. So uh -oh. this is, you know. I knew those questions. I don't know those. <laughs> and parents love this yep. because you can tell them, mm -hmm. hey, we're getting your student in early on the experience um, and real life experience. So even if they're an English major, mm -hmm. you know, they're getting real life company experience. How are our, you know, I made the comment about how our institutions aren't changing fast enough, right. or higher ed institutions aren't changing fast enough. So how are faculty actually mm -hmm. embracing or not this concept of working in partnership with industry right mm -hmm. there in the classroom with them? Or, mm -hmm. or heaven forbid, co-designing curriculum. My gosh, them. surprise, surprise. Right. <laughs> so one is, I never think that it needs to be all of our faculty, because we have 1,300 faculty and boy, you know, you can try to get that last 10% and you're not going <laughs> to go very far. You know, I, I think in the past, we have been very bad uh, partners on both sides of the experience. On the one hand, we have alums and, and corporate leaders who say, well, we want you to get involved, but we don't give them an avenue or, or, or an entree into that. And we just, we're frustrated because we don't support that engagement. On the faculty side, I think we do exactly the same thing too. You know, work with our community leaders, but it's in something that's not authentic. I, uh, one of the things that Nicole oversees is our, our residence hall, and for a long time before you were here, they used to always say, have faculty show up at move-in day. I'm like, really? Like, <laughs> like yeah. the, the parents have no interest in talking to anyone other than someone who can help move the stuff into the room, make sure the bed <laughs> is debunked or whatever it is, and then point to where Target is because the parents have forgot something they need to go find it, right? right? And I said, faculty are terrific, but let's put them in a place where it makes sense. Let's put it in a place, and so when you make a partnership between corporate uh, folks, government folks, uh, nonprofits, and so forth, you gotta be really careful about making sure that the partnership is something that would be sustainable. 
just putting people together in a room doesn't work. In the same way with our faculty, when we say, you know, you're working in a in in um, in our School of Molecular Sciences, they're chemists, and you and we have a company down the road that actually is a startup looking to figure out new ways to find biodegradable plastics. It's a match made in heaven. To be able to say, we want you to go to an employer panel just somewhere at some point is a waste of that faculty member's expertise and energy. So I, I think it's incumbent upon us, and I think this is where some of the technological tools we're using, like Handshake, and ways that we can really kind of make this kind of match.com work. It has to work with the faculty, too. So company, faculty, and students, if we can actually really vet what the experience will look like, what the setting is, where they could be value added to one another, I think that's when it works. And that's when, you know, as an administrator, I just let to watch the fun go. Yeah, that, <laughs> you know, you make the pair and then everything kind of goes from there. But without doing that kind of front end work or not having the right. tools to be able to do that, then I, I, think, um, I, I think we find we burn too many bridges. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that one wasn't a question. No, it wasn't. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, some faculty members will just resist. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. to Very steal a sense. line from W the other night, you know, you have to work with the coalition yeah, of the Yeah, exactly, will. right. Like, it's the people who want to engage with corporates that you, you that's work with. That's where you start. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I would think that faculty more and more, as we're bringing these industry collaborations, and now there's research opportunities, that there's so many other options besides just coming in to teach in the classroom that we can help to foster those connections and those relationships to make it authentic mm -hmm. and genuine for faculty members to engage with employers. Mm -hmm. um, Nicole and Grace, I wanna um, sure. ask this question of you. So we do look to expand opportunities to work in interdisciplinary teams that are focused on solving, Grace, you said co those complex problems. And so can you share with us how ASU promotes the development of entrepreneurial knowledge mm -hmm. and skill across a broad spectrum of its students, not just right. in engineering? Right. Um, I'll start. Yeah, that's cool. So one of the things that we are very deliberate about, we have um, an entire team in um, E&I, Entrepreneurship and Innovation, and uh, we recognize because of the demographics of our student body that we can't just assume that if we make opportunities available that the broad variety and, and distribution of students will show up into these opportunities and it's gonna look just like the rest of our student body. In fact, if you just say, hey, you announce it, we have these opportunities, come pitch your idea, get some venture funding, what tends to happen is white male students show up. Okay. So, um, and it, it, try it, <laughs> that's what happens. <laughs> um, because when you think of entrepreneurs, as an example, um, who do you think of? The guy who just testified in the Senate earlier, or was it last week, earlier this <laughs> week? I've, I've lost track of time because it was Friday, right? You think of um, the guy who's up in Seattle. You think of the other guy who's up in Seattle, <laughs> right? You think the guy, the guys who sit in Silicon Valley, right? The Protopia? Yeah, the Protopia, <laughs> right? So when you put out something that says entrepreneurship opportunity, that automatically is code for all of those guys I just referred to and I didn't even have to say their names, right? So, and if you look at entrepreneurship magazines and innovation magazines, we actually did this and we looked at just in the past year was something like 1% of the covers were not white males. So it's just so in our the lexicon of our society, entrepreneurship equals, mm -hmm. an entrepreneur equals a highly successful entrepreneur equals, right? And so we had to be very deliberate about our language, mm -hmm. about how we actually went and recruited students, who we sent to student groups and organizations mm -hmm. to talk about the opportunity. So, because if you don't see it as a woman of color, if mm -hmm. you don't, if I don't see it, I don't know that it's possible if I'm young, right? I don't, I'm not that young anymore. <laughs> if I don't see it, I don't know that it's actually possible possible, right? Or if I don't have somebody that may not look like me but mm -hmm. says, you know, it's okay, I'm going to help you through this, mm -hmm. right? We may come from different lived experiences, but I'm going to help shepherd you through this. So we had to be very deliberate. Mm -hmm. So we work with, um, we have coalitions um, that are identity based on our campus with student leaders, Black African Coalition, Asian Pacific Island Coalition, Native American Coalition, and we actually go and meet with them and sit with them and have conversations with them and we identify community leaders mm -hmm. who are 
in communities of color leading small businesses that aren't just high tech startups because there's a lot of entrepreneurs in this country that aren't leading tech startups, right? But are successful and might look like a lot of our students. So we actually, are, we're very deliberate about mm -hmm. it. And we have to be, mm -hmm. otherwise, all the money for the startups that come out of our mm -hmm. you know, entrepreneurship and innovation challenges go to white male students. And we've just perpetuated what, what's been happening um, just on a global scale again and mm -hmm. again. So we've, we've been disrupting it and we are very deliberate mm -hmm. about how we do this. Yeah, that intentionality piece is you critical. Have to be. Yeah. You have to be. I have two great examples of how we encourage interdisciplinarity and I have this one project that we worked on it was a digital health project where students had to design their own wearable biosensor and like these Fitbits and trackers. And the way we did this is we cross-listed the class between engineering, nursing, and design. So we try to build these systems thinkers in the sense that you could be the smartest engineer, sit there, design the best tool ever, like the best device, and then it doesn't work because the nurse can't put it on the patient, the patient won't wear it, you can't get it into the EMR. So there are all of these other issues where you have to really design and put people together to work in teams. And I think that's one thing that ASU does mm -hmm. really well. And then another example is that we're designing an interdisciplinary um, health solutions innovation center um, up but next to our partners, the Mayo Clinic. And just the building design in and of itself is you have to be very thoughtful about programming, who you put there, why you're putting them next to each other so that these strategic collisions can happen, and it just doesn't happen on accident. Right. So there we're having an incubator with entrepreneurs, we'll have med students across the street and physicians, and then nursing students and med students. So once you have this environment of very different types mm -hmm. of people working together side by side, then you get those ideas for it. And you can just grab, grab somebody down the street <laughs> and say, hey, what do you think about this? Right. So that, that's really exciting, but it, it doesn't happen by accident. Yeah, deliberate. Yes. It's being very deliberate. A lot of hard work in that. So um, to speak to some of our entrepreneurs maybe in the room um, and those that are representing various tech companies, what might be some pain points in the corporate engagement space, in the entrepreneurship space, in the academic space where a new technology tool could help alleviate some of those challenges or pain points? I'm gonna say the P word. Go ahead. Procurement. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, so yeah. sometimes when these new technologies come out, we're gonna have some t lag on how we integrate it into our system or how do we work with a company. So um, as fast as we think, we like to think we work, sometimes our it's clock still, speed yeah. is yeah. really over speed. And I think to add to, if I can add to it, yes, <laughs> Nicole will buffer this. Mm -hmm. um, I think to that piece for new companies that are looking to get into the public education space, security of student data yeah. and accessibility of that product um, is something that has to be like upfront and center um, to be able to get through that mm -hmm. procurement mm -hmm. piece. Right. Yeah. I mean, one um, somehow the accessibility piece. You know, so how do we not replicate in a technology what happens with human behavior where we attract, just like Mike's prior example, we attract people who are just like us. So we're designing a technology for people who are just like us when actually, I read the statistics earlier, you know, this, it, the, you know, our population's only gonna get more diverse. So how are we ensuring that, that any user who steps up to it feels like it's for them and it's mm -hmm. accessible for them and it's not for somebody else and they're gonna try it out or not try it out. You know, how do we really, and that's everything from the actual design of it, um, the language that's being used, the languages it's interpreted and translated into to the marketing of it, you know? So when you, you know, who's in your marketing? Who, what language are they mm -hmm. speaking? What, you know, mm -hmm. how are you marketing it? Who's marketing it? All of that. I mean. It, it matters, and then when you're talking about partnering with institutions as old as higher ed, um, it makes it a little more complicated, but I think that's where the tech sector can actually help disrupt um, the age old mm -hmm. you know, higher ed institution. Mm -hmm. But I think it's that accessibility, who, you know, put yourself in the, your customers and who are your customers. 
you know, one of the things that uh, sitting in an arts and sciences uh, dean's office, we oftentimes hear, and I heard it uh, over the past few days from a number of the business leaders here, that, you know, we'll, we'll take any student. And that should, like, make your students feel happy, the 90 majors I have. In fact, that may be the worst thing to say. Mm -hmm. um, it's really clear when you're a, a banking company and you want an accountant or a finance major, you say that. If you're a healthcare provider and you want a nurse or you want someone with some technical skills, you say that. When you say, we'll take ever, anyone, I can tell you the history major in that case doesn't think you mean them. But if you then say what we really want is someone who can actually marshal data, who can actually communicate effectively, who can write really well, who can think about the big picture, but also have attention to the details, the history major says, yep, yeah, check the box, I do all those. And actually they do them really, really well. I, I have a, I, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to look at a lot, and this is about this time of the year, I have two senior theses that are gonna be defended tomorrow, and this is a big, um, it's a nice milestone for these students. and. One of the things that is absolutely clear is that history majors are some of the best trained students in terms of what their outcomes are once they graduate. Um, they actually are able to do things in really complicated ways and take problems and kind of attack them, write them up and communicate what they find. Not that other students can't do it, but history majors do it really, really well. And they go, they're the ones who, many of the companies that I work with say, that's exactly the type of student I want. I said, but you didn't say that. In fact, what you said was what they hear all the time, that it's, everyone else but them. So one of the things that I think we can do is when companies talk in those terms, let's be really clear about what the value added that each student's program will bring to them. And they do cross over a lot. I would say biology students have some really wonderful skills too. But we need to be able to translate that both on the student side of what they've mastered, but also on the company side. What do you really mean? And let me show you how those two things then fit together in a way that your pool might be a little bit larger. You know, we're at full employment now. There, you know, the, the idea that you're gonna find exactly what you want out of this major for this time period in this geographic area, good luck, that's terrific. I hope that pairing works. But in reality, what it is, is I'm looking for someone who can do these things and recognizing there may be a lot of different ways to that pathway is something I think we need to help with in that, in that space. And then to get back to something that Paul mentioned earlier is we need to have these conversations with our faculty, with our, mm -hmm. our schools and colleges and the student support side earlier in the student career, right? We need to start having those conversations freshman year, sophomore year, so that, it, you know, so that they understand what those skills are and there's still time for them to develop mm -hmm. and there's still time for them to take either additional courses or, um, I was in a session today and they talked about like boot camps, right? Mm -hmm. You know, financial boot camps for the history majors, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> True. Um, and other Coding things, camps. right? So those mm -hmm. are things that we can help build or work with industry to build but we need to do those way mm -hmm. earlier in the, mm -hmm. in the college career. So we actually need to have those conversations with industry much sooner, like now, so we can understand the kind of um, systems, the kind of organizations and programs we need to build within our institutions mm -hmm. um, in order to meet the needs of where the jobs are headed. Yeah. So Nicole, to that point, mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes in the career center, we work with employers, we work with recruiters who are looking for point in time hiring, Yeah. right? Like their immediate need, especially with full employment, mm -hmm. right? Um, is how do I get access to your students who meet my qualifications so I can get them into my hiring pipeline now? So right. the, the concept of getting engaged earlier mm -hmm. and being involved in curriculum and having relationships with right. faculty, like, that doesn't meet their immediate needs. Right. So how do you change the conversation so that it is a value add to the employer? I think it's, a, a, it's both and, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, here are the students that we can help you right now with the immediate need, and we need to start having the conversation about what's coming, what are you building, what are you building towards, where are you mm -hmm. gonna be locating your next, mm -hmm. you know, fill in the blank, mm -hmm. what product are you developing? You might not be able to tell us about it, but you can tell us the kind of skills you're gonna need. Right, so it's, we have to be able to show that we can meet their immediate need and have this conversation about the pipeline for the talent mm -hmm. that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. I, I think we have to force the conversation and, and I haven't had a conversation with a company that's not willing to have both, mm -hmm. both, both of those conversations. So Great. that's my two cents. Grace, any thoughts on that Yeah, a well? really interesting conversation we had a com with a company lately is that they, their customers are having a hard time hiring talent to use their product. Mm. So it's, go, it's like a circular yeah. economy and they're going way back to us and saying, let's see how you can train your students to work our products 
work with our products so our customers can then hire your students and then buy more product. Oh, interesting. So it's just a fascinating wow. circular way. And I would say, you know, if they want to make adjustments to our curriculum, it's not a years long process. Right. It can be a few months, a semester long, just to, for them to see that those new skills get mm -hmm. integrated into our work. Yeah. Those are ongoing conversations that I know our team has on a consistent basis with employers, right? Because it's meeting both of the needs, mm -hmm. point in time hiring as well as ongoing student development and being engaged with us across a, a, a continuum of time. Mm -hmm. um, Paul, I want to go back to a statement that you made about um, kind of the cost implications mm -hmm. to organizations with turnover. I know for companies and organizations, that lack of employee engagement mm -hmm. and poor levels of retention represents real costs in terms of both productivity and finances. So can you share how ASU and maybe in class in particular work alongside employer partners um, to help with the continuing career development mm -hmm. and that ongoing kind of continuing education within organizations? So we had a, uh, a really wonderful evening with um, some of our community and business partners in the college, they brought in 60 very high level business leaders, C-suite leaders, to talk about kind of, part of it was to get some of these folks there, it was the millennial problem, right? And so, um, you know, we probably, have, if it was 100 years ago, it would have been, uh, I don't know, whatever the 19th century equivalent would be. I think every generation fe fears as if it's, children aren't connecting with the adults that should be uh, obeyed. <laughs> and the business leaders actually talked at length about the cost. That was one of the, the key components and the frustration. Uh, but the, the data, when you look at it, are, are I, I think also pretty clear too. Uh, millennials, um, yeah, do want flexibility. Uh, they're also super passionate about what they want. If you can tap into that and find out opportunities for them to reflect of where they want to make a difference in the world, not in the future, but like now, you actually will find an employee that is not only committed, but isn't committed on the financial side, they're committed on the, the mission. Um, you know, the other thing you find is the flexibility, if you ask a lot of the millennials, um, you know, yeah, you'd like to be able to come in late and leave early on some occasions, but you're willing to work like every day. You're willing to be connected through your iPhone or whatever smart up you have, whenever. And it's not even an, a question. We, I think all of us were bemoaning the fact that our emails didn't stop when we were here <laughs> and how frustrating that is. But the idea that you are always connected right. digitally to what you're passionate about is like, you don't even need to ask. That's what I'm supposed to do. We had to, to learn it. Yes. That is just yeah. their way of life. So I. I the, the, the clarion call that came out of that meeting is that they, the test driving these experiences through internships, multiple internships, small ones when they're uh, earlier in their programs, larger, more complicated. Um, again, you mentioned the kind of the job interview uh, as, as the internship, as the job interview. Uh, it's what they were recommending and to be able to have an extended relationship, and I think it goes to the question, how do you get the companies to buy in? Well, you can either have a short-term solution of having us post your job on our handshake site and you'll get applicants and many of them will fail out and you'll end up doing that a year from now. Or you can have a longer term solution where the investment, at least up front, might be higher, but in the long term you will get better uh, client, uh, employees and you'll actually have, a, a, the ROI will be far better under that model. But we have to be better partners on that. We need to be the ones who actually give them access to, to, to students from the beginning and help curate that. So we will have a lot of curricular the mindset of students from the minute that they're on campus through our ASU 101 and Career 101, which hopefully will be a one credit class for the spring year for our freshmen. Um, but to be able to get them in a place at which they start creating that narrative for themselves, to be able to connect with companies, in, again, in an authentic way and working with them wherever they're at. I, I, would, I would take any one of the companies to be able to say, here are all the possibilities. Which one do you want to help create with us? That's kind of where we're at with it is, it's in my best interest to make sure that we're replacing the students is as good as it can be, mm -hmm. and also to prepare the students in a way that um, I don't have to answer that question of what am I gonna do when mm -hmm. they decide to sign up for three. Kind of sick of it. It's orientation season, we can it, ask it, question a lot. Missing orientation, right? so <laughs> someone else got to answer that. Grace, I'm gonna ask for your follow-up because I know a lot of your work is with continuing education and, and um, working with current employees within organizations. So can you speak to that a little bit for us? Yes. Um, so 
tuition and education as a benefit is the new mm -hmm. thing. So we were just written up in Forbes actually about that too. So we work with HR departments and they're really looking at how do I redesign my tuition reimbursement program to make it more of a strategic tool for my company? You know, do I want anybody to be able to say, here's $5,000, you can go take whatever. I don't, I don't know why underwater basket weaving is always <laughs> used <laughs> as an example. It sounds like fun, actually. Like, <laughs> you can, you know, get a master's in underwater basket weaving. There are companies who, who do that, and they say, here's your benefit. But then there are other companies now, and more and more employers are saying, okay, now what are the key skills that I want people to have? Is it finance? Is it management? Is it organizational design? And they can start stacking those credentials or finding a partner and saying that if you go to ASU and you study these things, you will be more likely, or we hope to go to ASU, that you will be more likely to be on a track for promotion. And we're seeing that more and more, that companies are retooling their entire benefits mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exceptional. And seeing ASU as a partner and a resource, right? So it's not yeah. just for undergraduate right. or graduate education, but it's right. for that continuing lifelong education. Yeah. And it's getting away from degrees. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's really, what are your, what are the credentials? What are micro learning? What, mm -hmm. you Skill know, what sets. certificates? Mm -hmm. So it is kind of moving away from the traditional degree program, which is great. Interesting point. Great. So I'm going to ask for final thoughts from each of our panelists. Our time is wrapping up. So for our higher education institution representatives that are in the room, if there was one piece of advice or recommendation that you would offer up to better engage corporations, employers, into the career readiness curriculum maybe, mm -hmm. what would that one point of advice be? Paul goes first. Well, I, I would say start by making sure it's an institutional commitment. I think when we had the opportunity to build a career center, it was that the space necessitated us thinking about beyond that, but our conversations up until this point were all around the idea of what, how do we prepare students for life after ASU, and making sure that the folks who are a part of that bigger picture from our departments and our faculty for sure, and our alums who are, are hungry for this, but partners like Career Services, the way in which Cindy, like from the minute we actually said, hey, we're moving in this space and we want to create something for arts and sciences students, she said, well, I'm going to give you four staff and we're going to actually work on this together and that's been um, a, a real blessing. So I think it needs to be something strong buy-in. Uh, I think we're at that point in our college and, and a year from now, come by, you can come see our Future Center. We're moving in on May 17th. <laughs> um, so you can come check it out if you'd like. Um, I think it's the question who's not at the table. Mm -hmm. And I've been consistently and constantly mm -hmm. asking who's not at the table. So back to, you know, who's being represented, who's not being represented, who has access, who doesn't have access. You know, if we're trying to solve a problem with the same people in the room that we've been trying to solve mm -hmm. the problem with for 10 years, chances are you're going to come up with the same solutions. Um, there's a saying about that, I just can't remember it right now. Um, I, and I think it's really who's, who's at the table and not being afraid to bring in other parts of the university, but also other pr people from the outside mm -hmm. to lend their expertise. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to usually look very far. Your mm -hmm. alumni network would right. probably bring some really mm -hmm. um, passionate people who are committed to the institution, but have a very different perspective on mm -hmm. progress and what, need, what could be done. Very good, very good. Yeah, my piece of advice would just be just ask. Mm -hmm. Like people are happy to get involved, but sometimes you're like, okay, well, help us design a solution together. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, I can do that? Huh? Yeah, I'm right. happy to do that. So just asking people to roll up their sleeves and, and get into the weeds with you is fun. Great. Right. Well, Grace, Nicole, Thanks. Paul, thank you so much Thanks. for your expertise, you. advice. Thank you to our panel. And we are wrapping this up. Thank you, everyone.